Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, so my name is Daniel Markle. I'm Associate Director um, here at CMAC, and in that role, I'm also chairing the Skills Committee at CMAC. Uh, the Skills Committee is, is composed of uh, some academic colleagues, but also we have representatives from all job families from within CMAC and representatives from the student community and also representatives from the industry. And I think this is absolutely crucial that we bring, bring all together to, to, to drive kind of the skills development across CMAC, but also develop new skills programs uh, for, our, for our partners. Um, if, we, if we look at, at kind of um, uh, the, the, the demand really um, in, in this area, um, it's quite incredible. Um, there are several, several projections um, for, the next, for the next five, ten years, and, and one of them is, for example, that we have 26,500 um, new jobs um, by 2030 in the medic medicines manufacturing sector in the UK. So how do we how do we actually serve that? And this is really what we try to do within CMAC, within our within our programs, to develop the next generation um, and develop them with the right skills so that they can make an impact in the industry. Now with the with the with the pro, uh, with this session today, so we have uh, an excellent panel here where we will go through um, a number of questions um, and in particular look at the at the skills development um, in in the context of the lab of the future. Um, we will then also um, have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions, so please use the, use the app um, to post some, some questions or also um, just um, raise your hand later. So if I could invite the, the panel, please, to join me. And before we, before we get started with the, with, the, with the questions, we will, um, we will, we, I, I, will I would like to ask everyone on the panel, briefly introduce yourself, um, please also, um, just raise a bit your, or show, um, um, describe a bit your interest in skills development, um, and uh, yeah, I will ask perhaps Paul to start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Paul Chapman, and I'm a professor of computer graphics and virtual environments. I work at the Glasgow School of Art, and I'm director of emerging technology there. So. My real interests are uh, computer graphics and virtual reality and immersive environments. And I've been working uh, with CMAC for a number of years now. We have a good collaboration. You might have seen some of the demos that we've been doing. Uh, yeah, should I talk a little bit more or do you want me to go on a little bit more? Is that sufficient? Um, no, please, please go ahead. Um, we, have a, okay. we have a bit of time for introductions. Okay, so, so I like... Um, I like real problems as opposed to sort of blue sky research. I like trying to apply computer graphics and visualization to try and solve real problems. So I've worked a lot in the oil and gas industry. I was in there for several years in uh, pipeline surveys and shipwreck visualization, diamond mining, uh, some quite diverse industries. I've also worked in pharma for quite a long time. I've worked uh, in sort of danger sports visualization, so looking at how virtual reality can uh, improve certain activities where decision-making breaks down. So for example, like skydiving or um, sports where your heart rate increases, your decision-making breaks down completely. So in virtual reality, what we can do is we can really immerse you in an environment so that you're aware of what's gonna happen as opposed to um, previous training techniques. And I've done a lot of work in the heritage sector as well, so bringing um, like world heritage sites to the general public through virtual environments and, and computer graphics. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm uh, Richard Bourne. I'm a professor of digital chemical manufacturing at the University of Leeds, and I'm really interested in the kind of integration of cyber physical systems, so coupling machine learning approaches to physical reactor platforms, especially on the kind of drug substance side of things. So looking at chemical reactions. I guess in terms of this panel, I'm really interested in kind of the development skills, especially for synthetic chemists, who I think are quite resistant to a lot of digital technologies. And you know, there's a lot of distrust around kind of developing these techniques, but I think it's a, you know, a growing area where we need to make sure we encourage undergraduates. I'm quite keen to kind of tackle some of the questions, <laughs> looking at the training of undergraduates and how we make sure that everyone's got these digital skills. Um, so I'm a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Chair, and that's with AstraZeneca, so I've got to spend a lot of time at industry as well, integrating some of these platforms, uh, and see some of the challenges in terms of upskilling people as well. So 
you know, hopefully the next generation of scientists, certainly through some of the CMAC initiatives, will have these skills. But I, I do think it's really important we look back and make sure that we upskill individuals that have never had a, a chance to look at some of these digital transformation technologies. Thanks, Richard. Um, Linda, please. Make sure I'm tall enough, I'll look through to hear me. Um, so I'm Linda Nunes, and I'm a professor of cost engineering at the University of Bath. And when I say cost, I mean monetary, obviously, environmental and societal. So it's quite, it's not just money on its own. And my relevance on this panel is I lead the Made Smarter Innovation Center for People-Led Digitalization. And we got funded basically because when you looked at the report from Made Smarter, it basically, this is going to change the world. We're all going to have better jobs. And my view is prove it, number one. Second is actually... We have a lot of tech that is already usable but not being adopted and often what we see is it's the people's skills, engagement, and actually not necessarily the skills. How do we actually get people to want to do what we're doing? It's a big change management issue. So the centre I lead is transdisciplinary. It has engineers, it has scientists, it has policy, it has economics, it has management. It goes from digital twins to mathematical modelling of skills, etc. And what I will tell you today, which is probably quite important, I do have some facts and figures. So I do want to acknowledge our researcher, Dr. Aida Gaseo, Doris, if I can say it right, it's her data sets. So I'm not claiming all this. She's provided me all the data, so I look good, okay? <laughs> Next. Um, so I'm Katrina Clark. I'm the Skills Development Lead here at CMAC. Um, and my main interest is in developing of skills and training programs just to enable the workforce of the future and the transition to Industry 5.0. So I'm interested in developing skills and training for all ages and stages, so from STEM engagement to get young people engaged in the industry and want to work in it, um, through to our PhD students to, to have, so they have the right skill set to go into jobs of the future and they can become the leaders of the future workforce, and then obviously also the existing workforce, so how can we upskill them um, and develop their training in CPD to enable them to be able to use these digital skills within their current work. Um, I also sit in the MMIP Skills Group, so the Medicines Manufacturing Industry Partnership Skills Group, and we heard about that yesterday um, from Stephen Ward as well. Thanks. Um, Amy? Hi, thank you. I'm Amy Robertson, and I'm Principal Scientist for Crystallisation and Particle Science in Chemical Development at AstraZeneca. Um, so a key part of that role, which is really exciting, is bringing in our new science and technology. But aligned with that science and technology, we need the right skills. So there's bringing in the new skills for the new technology, but also upskilling our current workforce. Um, I'm really good part of my role is being able to coach and mentor younger scientists. So skills again comes into that and something I'm really passionate about uh, developing the workforce for the future. And I think it's becoming more critical because the rate of change is unbelievable. How far we've moved in the last five years, how far are we going to move in the next five years? And what skills certainly the pharma industry going to need to be able to address the challenges of our complex pipeline. Things are getting more complicated. Um, we're going to need new skill, skills to address that. So I currently sit on the CMAC Skills Committee as well as an industry rep on that, which is great fun working alongside all the academics here about what skills we're going to need and making sure that that's part of the conversation. And then back with that, within AstraZeneca for four years I was part of the gender diversity team. I'm really passionate about diversity in all forms being what's required for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So then let's kick off with the, with the first question. So and one of the key questions is, um, so what kind, of, what kind of skills do we need? Um, that does the future workforce need to really thrive or, or make an impact in, in the industry? But let me come to Katrina first, please. Yeah, so I think um, the future workforce needs to be had, have a diverse <coughs> workforce, both in the people and in their skill set. Um, so obviously we see the lab of the future image here and the use of all the industrial digital technologies. So we've got AI, robotics, automation, um, artificial intelligence. We've got the, you know, the augmented realities and the digital, digital twins. And we need the workforce to be, able to, these to be able to use these tools. So for that, we need it to be diverse. So it's attracting new talent into the sector. So that could be robotics, electrical engineers, people with computer science backgrounds, data scientists, um, people who can do computer programming. So we need them to actually work alongside and collaborate with our existing workforce. So we still need the traditional chemists, chemical engineers, pharmaceutical scientists, etc., to work with that. 
Um, so one thing we need to do is also to upskill the existing workforce, and something we're doing at CMAC as part of DM Squared is we're developing our skills factory platform. So this is our online learning and training platform, and that'll be used for training for our existing PhDs, etc., but also CPD to really be able to upskill the existing workforce and all these industrial digital technologies we want to use. Thanks, Art. Any other comments from anyone else on the panel? Can I make a couple of yes, comments. please. Yeah. So, like I say, we've had this lovely data scientist or, or econo economist to, to do all our, our analyses. We do a lot of work in looking at light task data and the job adverts that are out there. So, when you look at the pharma demand for AI, and by AI, I mean things like what knowledge and experience do you need, and I say machine learning, neural nets, and that kind of work, pharma ranked seventh in the world in terms of what it was actually not, I'm oh sorry, by sector and what they're requesting. They were behind the motor sector, chemicals, electronics. So that when you look at pharma job adverts, they're, they're seventh in terms of the type of adverts that are going out. And if you look at the intensity of the requirement, zero means you don't require much. Pharma have gone from 22 in 12 to 1.07 intensity up to 1.1. Now it does sound like a small amount, but it's quite a, a major bit about what is being requested. And it is things like data scientists, analysts, as you're saying, that are required. So in terms of pharma and your job adverts going out, you're seventh in manufacturing in terms of in the UK what has been requested in your job adverts. Linda, if I, if I can just stay with you perhaps for, for another question. Um, so are there particular challenges for SMEs to access, access those skills? So one of the things that again comes out is when you look at the data sets, um, people with the right AI skills can demand extremely high salaries. So you already know what's coming when you're an SME, you probably have a bit of less credit and you can't always get the kind of skills that you need because actually the big companies are getting in there with the high salaries and pinching the people sometimes where the SMEs can get to them. So one thing that came out, and I will again acknowledge, is a report from Stanford Human Center AI Center, there's a, a report out in 2023, I think it was, that it in effect says that you maybe need to be a bit more innovative. So one thing from an SME is, is if you went out and you're trying to find, say, four kind of, is it data analysts, is it the scientists, that you actually might, what you actually maybe find is actually maybe get one really good scientist and then you employ three analysts. And then as part of the SME, as you're seeing the training and the skill sets <coughs> building up, you're pulling them up. So they were finding that some really good um, examples of rather than actually trying to buy or recruit four data scientists, recruit one data scientist, and train with all the kind of facilities that are coming out, your analysts, so you, it might take a little bit longer, but what you do have then is that embedded skills within your company. So that's one thing I think the SMEs will have to do, because credit, and others, what they can afford, against the, the big pharma coming in and offering higher salaries, put you at kind of risk being able to recruit the exact skills that you might need at that point in time. Thank you very much. And if we, if we look at kind of the changes we, we, we want to implement, like the lab of the future, and we already discussed a little bit the diversity of, of skills we need, so, so how does that change also the composition of teams and the ways of working? Um, and perhaps if I can come to you, Richard, for an ac academic view um, initially. Yeah, so I think I'd echo um, some of the comments already made. The, I think the, the groups are becoming much more diverse in terms of the num number of skills required. So we've got many more computer scientists, chemical engineers, statisticians, chemists, all working together in a team, rather than having teams as kind of single skill sets. I think in terms of ways of working, automation has definitely changed things a lot. So especially after COVID, there's much more of a trend now of remote working, being able to set up experiments, come back the next day and have them completed. Uh, and that does enable quite a few things. So we've seen that it attracts um, people from uh, different backgrounds, perhaps, for example, being disabled or not being able to access the lab normally, wouldn't been comfortable doing those sort of careers, now coming to do kind of more lab-based careers through the use of automation, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. Um, another big thing we've seen change is that there's a massively increased need for more lab technicians. A lot of the automated equipment has certainly led to kind of an increased need for technical staff able to kind of maintain that equipment. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really pleased to see kind of more diverse careers in that area as well. Um, I still think, and, and Linda mentioned it, there is a huge issue in terms of staff retention. So making sure that, you know, there's rewarding careers that are attracting chemists. You know, we've had two PhD students leave in the last couple of weeks. 
both of them gone for software development jobs rather than staying in the sector. So I think it is really important that we make sure that you know there are attractive careers out there because these skills are massively in need in industry at the moment across many sectors. Yeah, so I think we, we have a similar experience as well, and especially with the digital medicines manufacturing um, research center that we are running at the moment, we have also a very diverse kind of um, um, skill set, and it's an absolute pleasure. I really enjoy it actually working in that environment, environment to see the different perspectives, and it's, uh, it's, a great, uh, it's of great interest um, to kind of engage and, um, with, with a multi-skilled team. Perhaps, Katrina, you can comment a little bit more because you're very heavily involved in that in that center as well and um, and in particular on the skills development. Yeah, so um, within DM Squared, we've got an astrophysicist, we've got computer scientists, data scientists, we've got chemical engineers, and we've got people from different sectors, people who work people working in oil and gas. And it's amazing how when they come together, they can work collaboratively and they come to challenges different ways. So they're able to, from their past experience, address the challenge differently and come away with new ways of working together, which are really helping us drive the outputs and get the deliverables faster for the project. Thanks. So moving, moving perhaps a little bit more to digital te technologies that are available now and coming to you, Paul. Um, so how can we best make use of them and, and really um, to, to, support, uh, to support kind of the education, research and operation with some of the new digital technologies that are coming through? Thanks. Uh, just touching briefly on that last question as well, as well about sort of multidisciplinary teams. When I worked offshore, I was always surrounded by people with the same mindset as me, which was uh, either computer science or electronic engineers. And you have a very blinkered way of solving problems. And what was quite refreshing when I moved to GSA is when you have a multidisciplinary team of maybe modelers, modelers or psychologists and product designers and all these different skill sets, you, you approach problem solving differently. And it's nice just to have you know, different ways of looking at, at, at solving problems. Um, but coming, uh, coming to your question, if you look at this picture that's up here on, on the screen, um, I believe this is in the uh, CMAC strategic document. Uh, so you know, looking, at, looking at the future. Um, but I think it's important to note that this isn't this isn't just a Photoshop, although it is Photoshop. But it's not just a, it's not just a Photoshop image. Uh, this is actually real, and we're we're doing this sort of work at at the moment. And on the right, you can see um, some, some some scientists there, some uh, lab people there, looking through augmented reality glasses at some equipment. And if you've hopefully a lot of you have seen some of the work on the Hololens that we're that we're doing with with CMAC, and this is an area that really interests me, sort of the whole concept, sort of digital twins, um, virtual reality, augmented reality, or XR, which is the overarching umbrella, um, coupled with, with AI. And I think this has huge potential. So the ability to accurately, visually model lab equipment, which we've done, so we've got uh, really good 3D modelers, which is another skill set, uh, 3D modelers, which might mean something different to, or modeling might mean something different to you as it, as it means to me, but if I say 3D modeling of, of uh, sort of computer graphics modeling, working closely with computer programming, which is a different sort of mindset, so you tend to be good at one or the other, and giving uh, people like yourselves the ability to potentially walk around an experiment from another country, or wherever you are, or at home, and to view the, the nature of your experiment, because all these machines, they all churn out data, so you can capture that, you can visualize it, uh, you can look at it remotely, or you might perhaps be looking at the real equipment itself, and you have uh, visual overlays, so you're visualizing data, scientific visualization of data, uh, for example, I don't know, massive crystals that are being processed or, 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 or growing, you can visualize that, or temperatures. And, um, and also from, so from an experimental um, view, XR is, is very, very powerful, but also from a training perspective. So uh, learning how to use complex machinery, for example, disassembly and re reassembly of an EasyMax stirrer. You know, we've built all of that into, into VR, and uh, it's very, very powerful. So f from my perspective, that's where the real potential is. You, you, with the whole sort of helmet-mounted displays, last year there was 11 new headsets that came out onto the market. And, and they're, they're getting really good now. And if you've seen like the Quest, the Quest 3, 
which is like 500 pounds. It's, 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 it's ridiculously good. And when I studied virtual reality back in 1996, the, the headsets cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, and they were awful. And now they're, now they're absolutely fantastic, and they're like 500 pounds, 400, 500 pounds. And the graphics are phenomenal, and they're not tethered anymore. So, you know, I can walk around this laboratory from home in my tenement flat in Glasgow, and I can see all the equipment, and I can visualize data that's streaming, and, you know, in the future, I'm going to be able to properly interact with it. So that, for me, is, is where I'm really interested, and I think there's huge benefits to this uh, discipline. Th thanks, Paul. So, um, so can uh, I just yeah. come in just add to that from an industry perspective? So we've got huge challenges to hit sustainability targets, and we always think very much on doing that, that we're, we're looking at our processes, but our travel footprint is massive as well. We work globally as organizations. We work with contract manufacturers around the world. So that technology is going a really long way to help address that. And then at a much more simple level, if you can train people on lab equipment, you're freeing up the lab equipment while they're training virtually, and it's making you much more efficient, and it also minimizes breakage and downtime of <laughs> equipment in the lab that you can go and keep training in a virtual environment. So there's, I think there's benefits across the board yeah, of just, having just, those skills. Just from the, just from the training perspe uh, perspective, Amy, as you just mentioned, I, mean, I, I understand that some of these probes that you use can cost significant amounts of money, and we can train people in virtual environments where if you drop it, it doesn't really matter. You know, it just, it just appears again, there it is. Um, so there's huge benefits there, but also from designing your experiment, you know, you can do all that from the comfort of your own home. Um, or in your office, you can move bits of equipment. And we recently d redesigned one of the laboratories in virtual reality as well. Um, and it's great because you can, you can try things in different places and then you can walk around that lab as though you're there to get a perspective of what it's going to be like. And you can see, oh, actually, I'm not going to fit or I can't walk around that way because that's in there. Or maybe the robot shouldn't be there. It, it should be over there. So very, very powerful. Yeah, I I, um, I had a look at the AR as well this week, and it was the first time that I saw it of the of the kind of equipment that we have been working now for uh, one and a half years, and it was just incredible to see actually the graphics, um, to see a single tablet moving and and how how smooth it all, all works. So I think this really changed significantly in the last in the last few years. Um, so coming perhaps uh, to, to Amy um, initially and then and then to, to Richard as well from a more an academic point of view. So what do we need to do more at the university level to really uh, um, introduce those those core competence skills, but also these advanced pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing skills? I think the skills and the training programs probably need to change across the whole remit. So we, we recruit at apprentice level, we recruit at graduate level, we recruit at postgraduate level, and we need to continue doing that. But I think everybody needs to come through with some level of digital skills. Um, so whether it's basic coding, whether it's Python, awareness of machine learning, awareness of AI, not to be experts in it. We still need our experimentalists. We still need people with that fundamental scientific knowledge of chemistry, of chemical engineering. But as part of all of that, how that links into the digital skills is becoming increasingly important. And I think we're tackling it at CMAC at the postgraduate level, but what's being done at undergraduate level, it might be more prevalent in chemical engineering. Maybe it's a natural move. How many chemists are coming through? learning programming skills, et cetera, as part of their degrees, because I think it's every skill set's going to need it going forward. Yeah. So how, how do we find the right balance? Um, because it feels like yeah, more and more skills that we need to equip the, the students with. But we, so we don't want to lose what we do right now, and we need to add and add and add. So how do we find the right balance? I mean, I think we just need to kind of, kind of subtly get it into the whole curricula. So it needs to be integrated across the curricula. We need to make sure that you know people are learning to use Python to kind of understand kinetics, for example, or do physical modeling of their systems and make sure it's across the whole curricula. You know, for example, Paul's nice example with the AR or VR type systems. Can we train people in using these systems to kind of experience some of the core, you know, mechanistic understanding that we have in chemistry and kind of almost get it in by osmosis? I don't think it needs to replace core concepts, but we just need to kind of make sure that virtually across the whole curricula, we get these kind of digital skills and experiences integrated. I mean, I think a big part, actually, one of our challenges is probably the upskilling of the educators. 
So I think <laughs> it's, it's actually making sure that the people that are teaching the content ha have these digital skills so they, they're able to integrate it. So that, that's probably one of the, the main challenges at the moment. Yeah, I was going to comment there. Yep. I think um, young people coming through are ready for it. You give a kid a headset, they know what to do instinctively. They're on their phones all the time. They're good with data. They know how to work it. So I think they're ready for the change. It's making sure that we have we have the, the thing in place to begin with so they can, we, can, we can deliver it. So, uh, th thank you uh, for those comments. Um, coming to Linda, perhaps, um, uh, could you could you comment on on how is the UK positioned internationally to compete for kind of that kind of talent? Yeah. So I'm allowed to say could be better, <laughs> right? So uh, if anyone's an investor out there wanting to fund it, I'd keep funding CMAC and some more schools. To be honest, because it's not going to go away, and you still need it. Um, so in terms of internationally. Uh, um, there is a, a metric on LinkedIn called, and I'm going to make sure I get it right, an AI skills penetration rate. On In terms of the jobs you're looking at, the kind of skills that are required in that job, by types of job, et cetera, and it's in, in effect an addition. And you get a global average for that. So if you look at the UK in terms of pharma, you're, or no, the UK, sorry, in general, we're 1.54 the global average. So you think, oh, we're doing okay. You look at India, they're over three, I think I've got the right number here, 3.23, so actually we're not doing that great, okay? And if you look at the UK, the countries above us include India, USA, Israel, Canada, Germany, and Singapore, and then we get to the UK. Positive, we are ahead of France, Netherlands, UAE, Italy, and Brazil, if that makes you feel any better. But there is, um, <laughs> we're seven, but we're still not going so good, right? And I think what becomes even more concerning, and this again is across all countries. So if you look at the figure, and I, I, um, I do look at gender, I do look at equality and diversity, et cetera. When you start looking at the breakdown of skills, in the UK we're 1.54, the global <coughs> average. If you look at gender, and I'm just focusing on male and female gender here, females are 0 0.57. So what we have is this cohort of people losing their skills, so we need to be a bit more innovative about, as you're saying, how we use these skills and get them into the market, 0.57. So actually, across the board, every country is dire. It's absolutely awful. So we have a whole 50% of the skill base that we're not reaching because we're not engaging them properly within our process. So if we want to up that skill set, we need to look at EDNI quite importantly, and whether it be um, neurodiversity, gender, or whatever, these are skills that, you know, if you look at neurodiversity, they're 40% more productive than someone who isn't neurodiverse. If you actually start looking at the data and drilling into it, so actually, if we get this right, we can access a skill set that's not been accessed. So I was actually being serious, there is still a gap, and I think with the, the CMAC train going, and I mean this in a positive way, I think you do need to you know, look at your, keep your PhDs going, keep things going to keep that skill set going, because I think they could get over that curve and, and some of the innovation you're talking about in terms of learning and teaching would be fab. So, yeah, so could do better. Anyway. Yeah, uh, you just mentioned that EDNA is, of course, a crucial, crucial, um, crucially important across all organizations and uh, particularly also for the, for the industry. So how do we ensure that we attract a diverse and develop a diverse workforce? I think this is something the industry has really started to tackle in the last few years, and it's all aspects of diversity. Um, and I'm un unable to quote the right report, but I know there's reports that when you have a more diverse workforce, you're more productive, you're more successful as a company. And I think certainly working for AstraZeneca, that's something that we've really focused on in the last few years. And it's everything from how you go out to universities and attract people. You know, if you send a diverse workforce out, People see people like me. Um, there's quotes on LinkedIn, you can't be what you can't see. And I think there's a, a role for companies and who we send out, wide age range, ethnic backgrounds, gender, everything, all aspects of it is really important. And then it's through how you advertise, <laughs> how you word your job adverts, how you screen CVs, how you interview, and making sure that we've got diversity throughout that process. So like isn't recruiting like, which, Unconscious bias, we've all got unconscious bias, and I think it's accepting that and building that into the recruitment. I think the challenge is, 
we can do all of that, but if the graduates and the future employees aren't out there, I think you have to tackle that diversity at the very beginning of the educational process and make sure that our degree programmes and our PhDs are equally diverse and then we're bringing through. Um, the other one I'm quite, <laughs> quite passionate about, I'll touch on quickly, is the I in ed &I, the inclusion part. We can do all this and bring in a really diverse workforce, but if we don't keep people and we don't let people be who they are and really use those skills that we've brought them in for, and I think we're becoming more aware of that, um, certainly with, with my own company, employee resource groups, lots of um, resources there to help people just be themselves. And I think for all of us in the room, whenever you're in a meeting, asking people's opinion. Don't assume someone will speak up. Don't assume everybody likes a big open room and they'll put their hand up and ask a question. So I think there's something for all of us about that inclusion part at all stages of careers. Y yes, please, yeah. It's just to build on that, because I think this is really quite important. Uh, under our Made Smarter Centre, we um, have done quite a bit of work on neurodiversity, and it is that inclusion. So we have brilliant policies that say, oh, well, well, we'll do this, we'll make sure, like in an exam, oh, because you're neurodiverse, we'll give you an hour extra. That's the worst thing you could do. It's actually just dire. It just makes it 10 times worse. And they looked at digital and how you could you use digital to actually be equity. You know, it's, it's equity is quite important. So that was really how you can use these skills and actually help people get the right support that is required to then leverage their skill set. And we're, we're quite poor at that, I think, across uh, universities and industry. And as you see, it's actually really being, getting everyone engaged, and that does make a difference. But then you have to train your managers well to be what I would call kind of generous leaders and actually notice things like that. Thanks. So I think th this, this is all also connected, I guess, to, to cultural changes and being inclusive across that. So how could, um, kind of augmented reality or extended reality help us um, to address some of these these broader challenges and yeah and and, and avoid the gimmicks of VR and, yes. and, and XR um, I just say when, when I when I studied virtual reality and in and computer science back in the 90s I would say that my year at university wasn't diverse at all um, now looking at the sort of the games programming um, and virtual reality courses that, that we run, I would say that they, they are much more diverse, which I, I suppose is, is, is a positive. Um, with regards to s sort of augmented reality and virtual reality and extended realities, a, lo a lot of people see them as a, a panacea, a, a solve, solve all problems, and it, it really isn't, isn't that. Um, and you, there has to be a real benefit of using the technology over existing over existing methods. Um, pe people, you know, get. I always think back to the the BBC uh, quite a few years ago. They changed the way they did their weather broadcast, the the way they told us about the weather, and they moved to 3D. And I don't know if anyone remembers this. I can't remember when it was. I think it was in 2000 sometime. And they suddenly went from, if you think about the weather, it's, it's really a two-dimensional problem. We want to know wh where the weather is at a certain eastings and northing. And uh, they suddenly got all excited because they had access to 3D software. And they put the, uh, the UK in 3D. And it was all twisted around. You couldn't actually work out where the rain was falling. And uh, it was very London-centric. So you had this big view of London. And then Scotland was tiny because it was all in 3D. And you couldn't actually see see what was happening. And it was a terrible use of visualization. And it was, an, it was an example of people just trying to jump on the technology and use it completely incorrectly. And I think there's, there's certain tasks where XR and uh, you know, VR and augmented reality, et cetera, is, is really positive. But don't assume that just using that tech for your problem is, 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 gonna, is gonna fix all, your, all, all, all the issues that you have. Um, the good news is, it's, it's less of a risk now to, to experiment with it because, as I said earlier, you know, headsets don't cost the earth anymore. So if you are going to invest and experiment, you don't have to spend tens of thousands of, pound, tens of, thousands of pounds doing that. But you know, what, what's the benefit of using certain technologies over just looking at a monitor, for example? And you know, this is my field, so I'm, just, I'm, just <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not necessarily selling it well, but you know, 
look at it and see, are there real benefits to that? Because headsets are still a pain. We don't, we don't, until we get to the point where we can just wear a pair of glasses and it's, it's less intrusive, people don't really want to be wearing HMDs. So, you know, what's the real added advantage and benefits to this? Having said that, I think trying to solve a lot of the problems now with the technology that we've got, knowing that it's going to improve, is good news because when the headsets do get smaller and lighter uh, and, and more comfortable to wear, we've already done a lot of the hard work. So we just recompile it for the latest technology and we're good to go. So we're, we're solving the problems now as we go. Yeah, I think you made a number of really good points. And I guess what I take away from this is as well, we, we really need those collaborations where we work together with like you guys, where you know the technology, you know what we can get from that. And we also kind of know kind of what skills we, we need in that, in that area together with our industrial partners. So I think it needs that, that collaboration to make best use of those, of those technologies. Yeah, definitely. Cal cal um, yeah, collaboration is, is key. I mean, myself and my colleagues, you know, we sit in these meetings and we, we, most of it goes over our head. We just do not understand the pharma stuff. But when it comes to sort of computer graphics and 3D programming, then, and that, those are the best uh, collaborations, aren't they? You know, where you're, you're really taking advantage of each other's skill sets. Those, those are the ones you really want. Yeah, absolutely. So is our, co considering all of that, what we just discussed, is our PhD program still feel, uh, fit for purpose, um, Richard? So I think I want to positively say generally yes. I think there are definitely improvements that could be made, but I think in terms of if you're a company looking for someone with technical skills, with digital skills, I still think probably the PhD cohort is much better equipped than the, the undergraduate cohort is currently. Um, I think there are some issues in the, uh, perhaps, that the PhDs are quite compressed now for students, and if they're learning new digital skills, you're either relying on them having some knowledge from you know, almost hobbyist type activities beforehand, or you're spending a lot of time training them which is difficult to compress within the normal kind of PhD time frame to kind of upskill them. Um, but I, I do think it is you know, a great resource in terms of getting skilled individuals. Uh, I'm really concerned about, I guess, the lack of students coming in the future because there is a, a decrease in the number of students being funded by EPSRC. So I think it's you know, really important that we keep lobbying governments, make sure we have the right number of students out there because certainly the experiences we have at Leeds, and I'm sure it's the same here at CMAC, is that these students are going on to great jobs. You know, they're helping the economy a lot. I think you know, it's not a bad in investment from the EPSRC. I guess the only negative I would say is that there probably is too many supervisors out there and some of the students are being sucked into, into projects where they don't get some experience with these digital transformation skills. And I'm sure that waiting will change as kind of you know, the older generation of supervisors uh, leave uh, and new skills come in and those, those supervisors get upskilled. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I still think that PhDs are probably providing the best kind of digital training at the moment. Um, if, if I was an industrial, um, you know, employee looking for new, new employees. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would like to add perhaps that I do think there is the student demand there. We have looked at that a little bit and over the last few years, in particular in our master's programs who are aligned with kind of medicines manufacturing across our partners as well. We have seen a, quite a big increase on that. Just in the last year at, at the master's program here, um, we have now doubled the numbers from last year to this year. So the, the students are coming um, through and they want to do a PhD in many cases as well. I think it's then providing those opportunities. And as you said, I think there has been um, also, it has been a little bit difficult sometimes to get kind of uh, consistent funding where we can uh, uh, do a structured approach like what we try to do here. Anyone else wants to comment on that? Um, yeah, so I think at CMAC we are looking at a slightly different way of doing our PhDs, which is great. So we've got our um, looking at our cyber-physical systems CDT we're looking to develop. And it's looking about research challenges. So you'll have people, PhDs, with a collection of supervisors. So then they're getting the, su the supervisory advice from different places rather than just the one field. And that will really help them with developing their skills across a wide range. And they're getting more collaborative work. And then if they've got several people all addressing the same research challenge, but from different angles. Um, so hopefully that will really help with them moving forward and that's something you can then implement in industry going forward as well when they, go, when they get there. Um, can, I, sorry, um, can I say I like that, right? Because uh, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking I feel like an old person now. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my goodness. But actually that group of supervisors against a set mission challenge, etc., then actually means you do have that mixed together. So actually you're probably self-training people like me 
from the younger generation as well. And, that, and I think that I think that's um, fab. Actually, if I'm being honest, I think it's a really very few universities I'm aware of do that. So if, if you're doing that, I just think it's well, I'm really impressed. Actually, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I also think we're in, the, in a good space for that because we are in a pre-competitive space where we can actually do something like that with our industrial partners as well who, who co-fund those PhD studentships. And they, we, we run this over several years now with co-projects and perhaps Amy want to comment on that. Yeah, I think the, the real world, when you go into work in industry, you do work in multidisciplinary teams. We solve problems and we deliver new drugs by a whole range of skill sets working together. And I think... Certainly what I personally have seen from the, the graduates coming out through CMAC is they're used to that way of working. They don't think twice about asking someone from another skill set. They can speak up in a multi-skilled team. And I think when you compare it to certainly the PhD I did, it's a whole different mindset. And you're, it's a much better preparation for going into industry. So yeah, please keep doing that. <laughs> we try hard. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, um, from a collaborative perspective from the PhD student. Uh, you know, we've got a PhD student at GSA who works very closely with, with, with CMAC, developing a lot of the, the stuff that you've seen in the, in the, in the demonstration. So it's, it's the collaboration of the PhD students as well, and uh, some, of, uh, some of our staff working uh, alongside. So yeah, collaboration's key. And I think in particular here, where it's really across uh, quite different disciplines, um, I think that students learn to talk to to, to students who come from a, from a completely different background, I think is hugely valuable to really uh, kind of learn the other language as well. So to start kind of talking together and then developing something that is really beneficial. Yeah, it, it might be worth mentioning that understanding the vocabulary of different disciplines is, 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 is a big thing now. So we, uh, we've we also got a degree in medical visualization and human anatomy and students in the first semester learn about 3D computer graphics, virtual reality, programming, modeling, and then in the second semester, they will then uh, do hands-on human dissection. So that it's a completely different vocabulary, it's a completely different discipline, but the, the students that sort of fall off the, the conveyor belt at the end have a really good understanding of, of both very different disciplines, both the, the, um, the human anatomy from the medical perspective, but also the computer graphics, virtual reality programming. So they can go and work for companies like uh, Toshiba Medical and, and places like that. Thanks, Paul. So um, I got now a few questions here on, on, on um, submitted. So if you have any other questions, please please do raise your hand. Then I will first go through that. Um, the first question is from Theo Tate. Um, we have commented on how we need to retain our skilled teams of diverse work backgrounds. What can we do to promote and retain skilled teams of diverse people? Who wants to go? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's providing opportunities throughout careers. We go in to industry with one role. I think so many people that I work with now have come through different paths. So you need to have that opportunity to develop and learn new skills. You've got to give people the opportunities to keep with what their passion is. Because if someone's passionate about what they do, they deliver a much better job at the end of the day. Um, but adapting our work environment to make it inclusive and to no longer go back to that, you work for this company, you fit this mold. And I think that's a challenge, that's a big change. But that's how we're gonna develop our workforce, we're gonna keep people, uh, yeah, it's everything from the day you recruit them all the way through, giving people opportunities, making them feel included and supported. It's having that support network because certainly around neurodiversity, you know, our current workplace, current environments might not fit someone's needs and it's how do we adapt that and still have, get the most out of that person and more. I think we've all got a lot to learn in the area still. Yeah, I think it's embedding all these principles across all of our activities that we do. Anyone else want to comment on that? Otherwise we will move to the next question. Well, you're just coming in. Um, how, how, do you, how do we upskill researchers so they are able to quantify sustainability benefits of digital technologies? I'm looking at you, Richard, now. <laughs> you want to comment first on that? Yeah, so I, th I mean, I, th I think you first got to skill them so they can kind of make use of these digital tools in a general sense. And I think that needs to start coming in in the undergraduate syllabuses fairly rapidly because I think 
uh, yeah, to make the, then the step on to look at sustainability requires the next level, I guess, of, of, of training. We certainly try now and integrate, you know, kind of multi-objective optimizations into everything we do that make sure that, you know, your algorithms, that your machine learning approaches are always looking at sustainability and make sure that, you know, that is a constant objective for these systems to look at, both in terms of, you know, time required, resource required, the amount of material used, all of these things must be included in, in your machine learning approaches, I think, um, you know, to, to tackle sustainability is, you know, a massive challenge. Linda? So I'm going to add a wee bit. I actually think, um, I think our students are already quite switched on. So if you look at all the data sets and you look at the analysis, I probably said 20 years ago, people would go for, say, brand. Now they don't go for brand, they actually go for cause. So actually, it's quite a, a change in dynamic, and you can see it from the students and you can see it from the school kids. You're training them from school kids up that actually they will start selecting companies that think green. They actually... I mean, you still got to pay your mortgage, I get it, but it's not all about money. So actually that cause effect and the way the younger generation, I sound like an old fart here, but the younger generation's kind of mindset is already set up that way. And actually in terms of the data analytics, it is to me, not necessarily, yeah, you need all the digital and, and the stuff, et cetera, but they're already working on bounding the problem. So it's getting them to think when they make a decision on machinery, what is the impact of that yes it might have better yield but the cause to get that better yield means you're like your carbon footprint's gone off the roof and actually they're, they're already doing that automatically so i think it is giving us a way to put that into the decision making i'm, I'm cautious of optimization because it may not always be optimization it depends on what lens you're looking at it towards what's optimal for you at that time for your lens so um but i, I think actually that's already embedded in. We just need to make it easy, as in minimal effort, for them to see that information to make an informed choice. But actually, I think it's the younger generation driving us to be a bit more cause orientated, not brand or, you know, you know what I mean by that kind of viewpoint. Yeah, it, I also think, it, it, yeah, it needs, it, building on that, I think it needs it needs that system thinking where you act, look at yeah. across across process boundaries. So you need to consider it all together. Um, to, to make informed decisions about is there a sustainability benefit across all of it. You can do it because otherwise you can just model for the next 20 years and make no decision. Yeah. So you just have to bound it, I think, and getting that yeah. bound right is key. Uh, thanks. So I got a message now from James Mann to find him. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Daniel. Uh, yeah, I'm just lazy. Um, so my, my question really, is, and this is an observation as well, that when we get our graduates and our postgraduates coming in, one of the key things I think they're missing in a lot of them is, I call it love of the lab, right? But actually it's love of the technical, okay? They seem to be on a, a mission to find a way to get out of the laboratory environment as quickly as possible into process-driven roles. And I'm gonna cite my colleagues in quality and supply chain. I don't know whether they think that's easier or not, but it's certainly become more prevalent. And I just wonder what we can do because we need all these multidisciplinary skills that we've talked about, but how do we retain them in the lab? And Amy's talked about passion, which I definitely, that's that's one of it. But, and, and from internally, you know, we have to incentivize those roles as well. But I just want to know what your thoughts are on that. Thanks. Richard, you grabbed the yeah. <laughs> 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 I think there still is a, a cohort of people that are absolutely love the lab and they, they want to be in the lab and they want to be generating experiments and, and you know, th that is their, you know, the, the magnus opus. They absolutely love being in the lab. And I think we need to make sure we encourage that and we, you know, we keep that there. And I think, you know, for example, automation is actually increased that love of the lab so they're able to do more, get more results from it. Um, I actually find the opposite. I had one student recently who's done 800 experiments. I'm like, you just got to stop now and go into the office and please write up the paper because we don't need this many experiments. So I, th I think actually the wave's hopefully shifting the other way, the being able to do more experiments, being able to visualize the data more easily, actually enables people to spend more time in the lab rather than less because hopefully the tools will facilitate them, you know, running more experiments. And you definitely still need people that are going to do the difficult things that can't be automated as well. So we still need a cohort of students that are more than happy to run 
you know, turbo green yard reactions and the like in a round bottom flask because the chances are we're not going to have a robot running that anytime soon. Um, it, yeah, I hope we don't need to kind of incentivize people into the lab you know, unnecessarily. I, I hope there are still people that you know, love being there and doing these things. Yeah, um, just building on that as well. Um, I think we have been we have also been discussing that in terms of kind of a living lab approach. How can we make also an environment where students can test in a safe environment kind of new technologies uh, that makes it fun as well, where they can fail without any problems. So kind of make this make the make it uh, the or, or kind of. Uh, kind of uh, destroy those bar barriers between office space and lab. So it's actually kind of these digital technologies are accessible in the lab. So it's much more smooth the transition between uh, an office space and a lab. I was just gonna add one little thing. Yeah. I think actually one of the dangers of automation though is that one of the things we've noticed is that a couple of the students who are very lab based, they, they love it so much that actually they never leave it alone. It's even worse than having emails constantly coming in. They are checking the equipment all night long. They're logging in, they're watching on the webcam, they're making sure it's, it's working the whole time. And actually, and actually it's something we do need to manage quite carefully because yeah, you can become all-consuming. All so I, I think, um, so obviously I'm from mechanical engineering. And I think the last pharma work I did was like probably about 25 years ago, to be honest. But one thing I, um, I do notice is a lot of the MEC people go into banking. I'm just going to cry now. So they all, we do all the skills training on them and all this number crunching and they go into banking because it seems sexy, exciting. It's in London, it's supply chain, it's it just a different type of mindset. So I think there are some issues where actually I do think there might be a pull away. And yes, there are people that still love the lab, but maybe again, that's where this diversity comes in. Some people that like working in, I'm not saying everyone, so if you're a lab-based person, please do not be offended. They, you, they might just like to stick to that a little bit. They don't want to chat to people. They don't want to do all this interaction. They want to just get on to experiments. And I think we've got to find a way of also pulling these people in and keeping them as well. So at the moment, by being generalists and saying, oh, you've got to be, do everything, you might lose some of that. So I think we need to keep that in mind. I'm assuming that's what you're alluding to, that you have all these people want to do supply chain and management stuff. and it all looks really exciting and pays more money and is in London or whatever. And actually sometimes you just need some good proper science doing. And then I, and I, so I think that diversity also might address some of the challenges there. I, I'm not sure. I also think the future, do you need to be one or the other? Can you do both? So we have the hybrid working, so we work some days in the office, some from home. Could we develop the role so actually they're doing a bit of both? So you've got your lab work and you're doing your other piece as well. So it's changing actually what the roles are in the organisation to have to have both within it. So they're not don't feel like they're missing out. They need to jump to one or the other. <laughs> Andy, I saw a question from you. Can I ask you to ask that directly? Yes, I think I, I think I can remember what I wrote. Um, so yeah, so we've. we've Panel's touched on this a little bit, but what we focus on quite a lot is university level education. Um, how do we as a community engage earlier in, in earlier stages of education to ensure that school leavers have the skills that are, that are needed for a digital workplace? So I'm going to be a bit more provocative here. I actually don't think we have to worry about that. I'm sorry, I just, I, I mean, I. I think a three-year-old can swipe a computer quicker than I can. I, I know it's not quite the same, but I think that's already good in there. I think it's, it's the squeeze middle is a bit that we probably need to focus on. And it's not, but I'm not saying you don't worry about university, because you do, because we, we, we can handle that, we can get that in hand. I think it's back to, as you're saying, the in-workplace development, that squeeze middle. We have a lot of expertise. Squeeze middle is not, probably not the right word, but you know what I mean? The, the people are already in work. I think that's where our focus should be. And at the moment, I think a critical focus should be on leadership. So any of your digital change isn't, and all the data will show you this, it isn't actually about the individuals, it's about management and leadership. So if you can't get your leadership to change their view and push it through, and I don't mean push it through as in you must do this, they can't lead it in an effective and inclusive way, that's where we're getting lost. So I think to me, I'm not saying you ignore the schools and you ignore the universities, I think those in industry, and especially particularly targeting the leadership to actually understand, to give them confidence to do digital, to be honest, I think is what's probably more for this next five years. Longer term, I'm assuming school people will come through and will have more skills than half of us already. 
I don't know if that's backed up by data, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> Um, can I respectfully but slightly disagree with uh, with that? I think I think there's a uh, um, there's a wider note. piece here because um, I think um, statistics that are published by um, women in science and engineering show that really the most significant time to influence someone's future career is between the ages of 13 and 16. Yep. And I do think that unless we begin to make the right associations between science and data at the right stage, there's a risk that we're actually going to lose the next generation of scientists to th science no longer being seen as, as sexy, particularly in a, where, where we, we live in a world where we think that artificial intelligence at a simplistic level can solve all our problems. The younger generations might actually start to think that you know, computing and data science is the way forward, and actually science is a little bit obsolete um, in the old-fashioned sense of, uh, of the world. Also really agree with what um, Amy said, is around um, the visibility, um, the, the, the mentoring, the opportunities for networking, and I think this really needs to start, uh, you know, those, those role models need to be visible really early on, you know, just so that the scientists of the future can see. Yeah. So you're 100% correct on the WES data, and you're 100% correct in terms of, I mean, I've been looking at trying to get change the mindset for the last 30, 40 years. So that data is well known and well, you're 100% yeah. right. But that's across the piece. It's across the piece from science, any kind of engineering, yeah. selecting physics, and it tends to happen in the age when you're just about going into secondary school, and image is really quite important. Yeah. So it's not a necessarily a, a scientific thing, it's actually how do we make science exciting yeah. and some of the role models coming out and i may i know it sounds a bit tongue-in-cheek but like your marvel models or your people that are actually you're doing science by stealth i don't know if that's the right way to say it. you're doing it by role models that are not necessarily just people it's also they're the superheroes and they're the superheroes that can actually have that skill set they're seen as like not just the, the bimbo on the side or whatever that's looking all good they're actually someone that can is a, a pure scientist as well there are ways to do it, but that actually that shift over the last 30 years has not changed that much, even with the millions and billions of investment in trying to change it. So I think we need to get a bit in it. So it's not saying ignore that, but it is then actually, I mean, it's fact, we, we can see it all, but I think there's more to it as well. We have, we can keep working on that, but I think we need to get a bit more innovative about how we do it. And that transition phase in terms of image, age, you know, it, it happens probably more to women than boys because boys actually, I think, get left behind in different ways. You know, there's a real issue we have there when we come later on when we're, they don't quite necessarily focus as well depending how we assess them in terms of capability. So there's a lot of stuff there. But yeah, you, you're not incorrect, but it's a, it's a problem that we've all been trying to deal with for, since I can remember coming into manufacturing and it's still not been solved. Anyone with a bright idea, you'll make millions here because I don't know how to solve it. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I've got a question slash comment. So I think on, like this, on primary school level, I have quite a few younger siblings. And I see that when I was in school, so now they're in school, it is becoming much more, much more digital. So I think you know the basic skills of how to use a computer, how to use Excel, Word, that will be coming much more naturally to people. But I want to come with maybe a question, comment from a kind of undergraduate perspective. So four years ago, I was finally undergraduate in chemical engineering. And all my classes, we were doing all the calculations, all the tutorials, equations, pen and paper, lots and lots of, we spent all the hours you know, doing lots of calculations. But this morning I was tutoring the same class I did four years ago. And they're all doing all the questions on the computer, either on MATLAB or on Excel, which is great, because that's how we teach them to, you know, do it, you, they do it better, more accurately, more quickly. They can spend time thinking of the problem, not how to just do adding or subtracting. But the exam is still the same. So they're still examined the same pen and paper way. So like, yes, you can use this nine, nice regression, but remember in the exam, you need to do it by paper. So how do we get, we know it's important to do it digitally, but how do we get them examined, assessed on the way that they work and the way that we want them to work and not the way that we've always examined people since forever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that really good question, who wants to take it? 
Yeah, so, so I have a little bit of experience because I'm a part of Imperial's DigiFab Institute, and I think they do a fantastic job for their MSc students, for example, of making sure that most of those skills are tried to be accessed by coursework rather than doing it for exams. And I do, I totally agree with you. I mean, the amount of tutoring we do in chemistry, for example, on deriving kinetic equation from first principles and then working in that way rather than using ODEs in MATLAB, it blows my mind because if, if you work in an industry, you're just going to use an ODE and that's how you're going to apply it. And being able to have those skills, I think, is much more important than actually being able to do those derivations. I'm not saying you need to remove all those derivations, but I think we do need to make sure that people are able to use those skills and, and do it in a way that is you know, examinable in some, in some sense. Uh, but I think, you know, a preference for trying to use coursework, trying to get people to do presentations and show the, their ability to use the digital skills rather than being able to derive things and do it algebraically. So I'll have one little comment on this. I think um, curriculum transformation, the universities are failing if that's what we're still doing. And I think in physical sciences, we're all quite traditional, if I'm being honest, which is chem -eng and mechanical are, are very similar. I think one of the things I'd be cautious of is it's also about if you do everything by computer, you think it's right. Now, I'm a bit old fashioned. And if I get CAD drawing, so I get a lovely CAD drawing from a student, and at that point I say, well, go and try and make that down the lab, because trust me, you can't bend that, whatever you're trying to do, because they think the computer is right. So I think you need to make sure you get that critical understanding of what's coming out of the computer. So you need some physical engineering science understanding, but it's getting that right. But I think a lot of universities now, if you speak, to, I guess you're doing it as well, everyone is, the word curriculum transformation is coming out our ears. And some are doing it very well. Like you say, you'll do coursework focus or problem-based solving. Others have been quite lazy. But I think if we get that right, because you, you're right, we learning an equation by heart, I would never, if I've got a, a life-saving thing I've got to do, I'm not going to assume I remember it. I'm going to check it. <laughs> you know, I don't have to remember it, but I do need to understand it, and I do need to interpret the outputs in a, an appropriate manner. So it's just making sure we don't lose that bit of skill set of interpretation. But yeah, I, I'm with you. Don't, oh gosh, I can't remember line of an equation if I, you know, whew, too much, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so the, uh, okay. One final question Sorry. now, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is, uh, this is kind of going back on, on what you've just uh, been speaking about, but so I've been really lucky, I've been an apprentice. So I've done the apprenticeship route, which has made me like, not to blow my own horn, but like a perfect fit for industry. But I know a, a lot of people in my year would not come out of university and be able to do the job that I do. Like, do, how, how do you think you can kind of bridge, work to bridge the gap between, you know, a standard chemistry, chem -eng degree, and what's actually required when you go into industry? Because I've developed so many other skills I wouldn't have if I hadn't done an apprenticeship. Um, I just feel like there's there's such a massive gap for the other people I went to university with. And I know that they're going to, I mean, they, they obviously they will get jobs, but they'll probably struggle a lot more than I will. Thank you. So I'm going to be a, a bit rude here as well. Not, not to you, right? <laughs> but um, I think sometimes our undergraduates need to clip across the ear. They're quite arrogant sometimes and think they know everything, right? But I also believe it is not, and, and this probably will upset most industry people in here, it is not our job to have all been ready graduates coming out. It is our job to teach graduates to be able to think, learn, and question. And I think, I think the apprentice, is it an apprentice degree you did? I think they're a fab idea, to be honest. I, I think they're really good because you get the best of both worlds. But I, I think in terms of, and I, but you don't want everyone doing that. You, you need a, a bit of a mix. But I do think it is, again, the, a balance between is lifelong training, which you've, you've all referred to, I, I think is important. But I do think it is recognizing, yes, we have to have graduates with the capability to, to be useful in industry. But I strongly believe it's our job to educate them, not to train them for industries. I know they're not mutually exclusive. There's overlap. And I think that sometimes gets a bit um, mixed up sometimes. So I think we've got to get that right. But I, yeah, I think what you've done is probably to me is a win-win because I, I think they're really quite good things to do, in my view. But I, I think it's not all undergraduates are incapable. 
but they do need to get a reality check. And they need to get a reality check that, you know, go down and speak to the technician. They know more than I can tell you. That's how to integrate people, and they're not very good at that. I think they've become, a, we need to bring them down a level or two in the, in the nicest possible way. I'm now going to be shot by everyone, aren't I? So I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> So th thank you very much. Now the, the clock is now dark red, so I think that means that um, we're coming to a close of this session. I would like to thank the audience for being really engaged in the session, and particularly thanks the, the panel. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you.